the next guest, I've never actually had the opportunity to meet her in person, but I've long admired her. Rochelle Riley with us here on the Mega Cast. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And happy birthday to Tyler. I have shoes Thank older. Than <laughs> right? <it>. Right? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, with that, though, um, you, you were a longtime journalist. You were with the Free Press for, what, more than 20 years? And, well, oh, my goodness. It seems like it was yesterday that you left. Um, you said goodbye to your career. You're now working with the city of Detroit. So before we jump into your book, because I definitely want to talk about your book, uh, talk about the transition and how things are going as a city employee. Well, I feel like I went from one pro public service job to another. Um, as a journalist, I was someone who kept my eye on city government, and now I am working for city government. So there would be some people who would say that I went to the dark side, but my side isn't dark because the only job I ever would have taken was this one as director of arts and culture. Um, back in uh, the spring of 2019, we were having uh, really tough times at the paper, and there were about to be layoffs. And I had been thinking about leaving because I said, if I don't, I'll be here another 20 years doing this, which would have been great. But if I want to do something else, I better do it. So I asked the editor, if I leave, can you, you know, will that help with the layoff problem? So between a couple of other folks deciding it was time and me leaving, they didn't have to have any layoffs. And I got a new career. My heart breaks for what's happening uh, in the news industry, even more so with the newspaper side of things, because uh, newspaper journalists, you really are the backbone of our community. And your words are so important, and to see what is happening, but we all have to adapt and we all have to change, and you've done that with the city of Detroit, but you also did it, and then shortly afterwards, we go into a pandemic. Focus is not so much on arts and culture, at least in the beginning. My job is to make sure that there are dual focuses, because as we deal with just the worst thing that has happened for our country, I mean, as a whole, since, you know, the, the just past the century Spanish flu, um, we have to really focus on how we're getting through this, how we're getting to the other side. We're doing it through changing our health. We're doing it through making sure we do the things to stay safe. And we're doing with, with art and music and poetry and all those things that we love that we're stuck at home. So what else are we doing? We're watching television. We're reading. I, I want people to really know that if you love these things now, you want them around when the pandemic is over. Even more so, you know what, I miss live concerts. As soon yeah. as the opportunity is there, I will say I've been a little bit hesitant about getting the vaccine, but if a vaccine's required to go to a live concert, I'm going to get it. I, I miss live music. Well, I would show you my Band-Aid, but I'd have to take my sweater the wrong way. I got my vaccine on Monday. and. Um, I, I did it for two reasons. One is because it will make me safer, and two, it'll make the people around me safer. Because as an essential worker, I'm, I'm out, and I'm doing things, and I'm, I'm keeping that job going. But I'll tell you what I miss, movies. I'm somebody who went to the movie theater every Friday for the opening of whatever was happening. That's just how big a film buff I am. I've not been a movie theater in one year starting this Friday, and I'm like, that's just unheard of for me. I almost didn't take the job in Detroit because when I first arrived almost 20 years ago, well, 20 years ago now, there was no movie theater within the city limits. And I said, well, I'm not coming here. But I'm here. There are theaters in Detroit. There are theaters everywhere else. And I haven't set foot in one of them. Oh, it is heartbreaking. And what's hard, too, is the movies aren't there yet. You know, we're still waiting on the release from Hollywood. And until New York and California releases their restrictions, they're not going to release those big blockbusters. So, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to binge it on Netflix. But uh, with that, can we talk? Because Detroit was on, I felt, like an upswing of momentum with not only the restaurant scene, but the scene. But what came with that was all the talk about the culture and the beauty within the city that we all know has been been there forever, but people are now seeing Detroit in a different light. Has that taken a pause during the pandemic? Absolutely not. We are on an upswing that is not going to stop. But I'll tell you, in addition to the things that are already still happening, because construction is still going on under guidelines, people are still moving to the city, but we are now literally becoming a national model for how we're handling the COVID uh, pandemic. 
uh, I have friends, quite frankly, in Oakland County who call me every day saying, okay, can you get me a vaccine? Can you, can you take me to get a shot? Where if you live in Detroit, I, I was in and out in 30 minutes. Um, I, I, I love how we handled the testing, opening up the state fairgrounds so that we wound up eventually providing tests for people outside of Detroit. I, I think that we are at a point now where people are gonna have to stop focusing on the past Detroit and look at the current Detroit and what I hope particularly through the arts will be the future Detroit. There is nothing that's happening anywhere in the country that's not happening here. And we have amazing talent, not just in Detroit, but in Southeast Michigan and in Michigan. And by God, I'm gonna be the biggest cheerleader for it you've ever seen. That's so awesome. Rochelle Riley with us here on The Mega Cast. She's the Director Arts and Culture for the Office of Arts and Culture and Entrepreneurship for the city of Detroit. But you're also an author. That must feel pretty good. You recently wrote a new book, That They Lived. Tell us about the book before we get into trying to do a book tour during a pandemic. Well, I can tell you um, in 2017, uh, there were these amazing photographs that showed up every day of Black History Month of these beautiful, beautiful uh, African-American women who have changed the world, accompanied by a photo of a little girl who not only dressed like them, but embodied their spirit. I mean, every single day I looked and I was like blown away and I thought, oh my God, this is stunning. How, let me just show you real quick. Wasn't it, wow. the costumes oh, were <laughs> incredible. To the, I mean, to the detail, I mean, buttons, bows, makeup. So it was great, but I was working on my book, The Bird, and I said, oh, that was really great. That was fun. Let me get back to work. So The Burden came out in 2018, and February of 2018, that month, there we go again, these amazing photos appeared again. Prominent, important black women who had done amazing things, and this little girl literally embodying them. And I said, oh my God, I have to find out what this is about. So I tracked down Christy Smith-Jones, who lives outside of Seattle in a little town called Kent. And I said, I love what you're doing. Why are you doing this? And she said, my daughter, came home, she was five, and talked all about Martin Luther King and what she learned about him. And she was so excited and she got really into it. And I said, I've got to keep this going. I've got to make sure she remains excited about learning history. So becoming these women helps to do that. Um, and I said, well, I would love to provide, you know, the thousand words that should go with these pictures. I, I'd like to do some, you know, biographical essays to tell their stories because people need to know their stories. And she said, oh God, we couldn't do that. These are just my pictures. And I said, no, 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 we, we really could. I had to fly to Seattle, get a car and drive to Kent and take her family to lunch and convince her to do it. But she let me do it and that's how That They Lived came about. And it is literally a passion project for us because we want every child of every color in the world to know that every important person was once a child. And, and to see it through the eyes of a child as well, it allows us to relive their lives with the innocence of a kid. It's for children nine to 90, because if you miss that point in your childhood where you might've taken a different journey, it's never too late to turn around and try something new. Um, I'm, I'm living proof that you can do something different. Uh, in, in spite of my having the dream career, the career I'd wanted since I was eight years old, I'm a writer by trade, warrior by necessity, and I've been that eight. But to have this different career, but also still continue to write, I could not breathe without writing. So this gives me the opportunity to do both. Uh, so with that, I will say um, my sister-in-law, uh, the uh, she had written a book about my father-in-law, and he was the um, first and only African-American FBI agent killed in the line of duty. Woody Woodruff is my husband. It was their father, Edwin Woodruff. Uh, but just as she launched the book, the pandemic happened, and you're going on a book tour and everything gets shut down. And that is where you go to really spread the word. Yes, there's social media and yes, we have technology today, but it also put a stop to some of those events and you're trying to do Zoom, but it's not the same. So how are you going to address that and trying to share this book? Well, I can tell you initially, I thought I might be devastated because I'm a people person. I love meeting people. When I did The Burden, I did 80 conversations around the country talking about the burden that this country needs to put down if we want to move forward on race relations. 
But this actually has turned out to be not so bad because you can do two of these a day, every day, all the time. By meeting more people, I don't get to shake their hands or hug them because I'm a hugger, but I do get to meet all of these folks, which means I'll be doing these until we can actually do them in person. And I'm willing to go back to any place that wants me to come back in person. So, so it's working, uh, but it's not the same. So, uh, Rochelle, uh, do you have kids? I have one daughter who went to West Bloomfield High School. Go Lakers! Uh, what was it like to share this book with her? Well, let me tell you, the more important thing for me was my grandson, because um, if you look at the cover, you'll see that this was her daughter, Lola, who was in the initial uh, photographs. And when she said she didn't want to do the book, and I convinced her to do the book, I said, we could do an encyclopedia. We could... Um, you know, famous sports stars, famous business people, famous scientists, famous. And she said, oh no, we're not doing any of that. I'm only gonna do the one book. And I thought, well, wait a minute, but you know, we've got boys and we've got like these important men. And she said, I'm only gonna do the one book. I said, well, then we gotta include men. We, we gotta have women and men. And she said, well, I'll do that, but we have to find a boy. I said, I've got a boy. So I flew to Dallas, I got my grandson and we flew to Seattle. <laughs> And what she had done with Lola over this long period of time, she managed to do with him and capture these amazing moments um, over a four day weekend. And we do like a half an hour photo shoot and then 15 minutes of Fortnite and cupcakes and then another half an hour photo shoot. And we were able to capture that. When the book was finally a galley, I didn't want to send the whole thing so we'd be overwhelmed. I sent uh, three, I think I sent three chapters, three essays. And one of them of course was Muhammad Ali. And so I asked his mom, I said, okay, did he open it? She said, yeah. I said, is he reading it? She said, yeah. I said, is he like really reading it? She said, yeah. And I said, okay, let me talk to him. I said, what do you think? He said, Avi, which is what I'm called because there's no such thing as the G word in you know, my life. Avi, it's great. Okay, that made my day. No other kid in America, no other kid in the world said that he liked it and, and, and read every word of the three essays that I sent. So it got the Caleb seal of approval. That's awesome. Made your heart smile and his as well. But really, this is for the generations because when we can see history through the eyes of a child, but also remember where we came from. And while we've made great strides as a society, some days it feels like we have not hardly moved at all. And we still have so much further to go with that. And I will say, um, if we can kind of go back to your role there at the city of Detroit, um, one of the most touching events that I know that you helped put on was the COVID-19 memorial. What was that like for you? Well, Mayor Duggan, who has regular meetings with constituents, wound up having to go to Zoom. So he was having Zoom calls, you know, that he does every week with just residents. And this woman back in April of 2020 said, uh, I, I didn't have a funeral for my mom. We, we have to do something. You need to do something to honor all of these folks who were just dying. And, and that April, by that time, I had lost eight friends. And so he turned to me and said, we have to do a memorial. And that was it, that was all he said. So the first thing I did was try to figure out how can we have a memorial that people can't come to? And then I thought, how can we have a memorial that means something? I mean, it, it can't be just an announcement or speeches. And so um, right about that time, and I don't remember the timeline, they announced that there wasn't gonna be a dream cruise. And I went, oh, we can do it with cars. And then I said, well, nobody's just gonna drive around and say, okay, let me drive around. And I said, well, they need to have something to look at. So there was this progression of thoughts that I had with Gretchen Whitmer in my head saying, social distance masking, you cannot gather. So I came up with 15 funeral processions going around Belle Isle. And the reason it was funeral processions, I said, well, let's just let people drive around. And it's then chief of staff said, you're not gonna get people to stay in the cars. They're, they're gonna wanna get out and touch these, because they're billboards, they're four by four foot signs of their loved one. They're gonna wanna get out and touch it. They're gonna put flowers up. I said, okay, I gotta keep them in the car. So I called uh, funeral home directors and I knew six of them and I called you know, five others that I didn't know. But when I told them what I was doing, they all agreed literally to be there. And so you, you will not get out of a car during a funeral procession. It's just not done. So we actually had home goings that these families could not have. There were 15 funeral processions past 907 billboards going around the island. And um, I wanna thank WRCJ Radio because they provided the soundtrack with classical and gospel music. So we had everyone turn their radios to the same station because we couldn't have bands or singers or you know, would have loved to have the symphony out there. But And so they drove around to this soundtrack, passed those photos, and then we kept them out for two more days so they could go back. And people had 
barbecues. They had prayer sessions. They just, I mean, just these gatherings around these photos. And when it was, excuse me, when it was over, we gifted the photos, these billboards to the families. And one of the most touching things was one of our uh, neighborhood uh, district managers was driving down a street and saw the photo that covered an entire window in someone's house. So when you drove by, you could see that face. And that was just really moving for me. So it, it was a way to bring some closure to families who didn't have a chance to. And it was the largest public art the city has ever done. So I was really, really thrilled and have to thank those folks who were out there with me pounding signs and making sure they didn't go into the river on the day. We almost had a, you know, one of those days where it's like, get the signs, don't let the signs blow away. Um, and and uh, it, it just worked, it worked, so thank you. Well, I could say uh, the city of Detroit, they were so lucky and so blessed to have you in this position. And I know that uh, all of us as your readers, we miss you in your old role, but I know that you are doing so much for the city of Detroit and keeping the spirit of the city alive, but also attracting people to the city to let them know. Uh, what the city is about. You know, one of my ha most heartbreaking things about Detroit was sometimes I felt the people in the neighborhoods got lost in the conversation. And they are the ones that are the true heart and the true spirit of that city. They didn't have the opportunity to get up and move away and leave their neighborhoods. They stay there and uh, they connect with one another, whether it's through an urban garden or through music or uh, it's so many different ways. And so the city of Detroit by far is very much the lucky end of this for having you in this position. It's so awesome to say that. I do want to tell you that my focus is the neighborhoods. I'm moving the Detroit ACE office, arts, culture, and entrepreneurship um, to a neighborhood. And we're going to focus on neighborhood, uh, neighborhood uh, culture and arts. And we're going to use arts and culture to literally uh, serve as a catalyst for neighborhood growth and making sure that people know here's someplace great that you can be. That is so beautiful and so wonderful. And uh, there are a lot of people in a lot of neighborhoods. Um, there is a housing uh, division that's on the east side um, over by where they're building the new perfecting church. And I know that as part of their neighborhood, they also built an art center. And um, if we could get more of that in the city of Detroit, we need to let everyone know that they have beauty and they have value and they can do that by using the arts because you know we can all afford a, a little bit of paint or even a, a stick in the dirt it's going to happen uh, you're going to see a lot of that coming art centers art houses but uh, the most important thing is hearing from residents about what they think is important for their neighborhoods and what they want and what they want is what i hope to give them that's so awesome we're li you're listening to 89.3 wbld and What's the other call letters, Tyler? It's uh, 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake and 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills. Exactly. See, I need my cheat sheet. Hey, uh, Rochelle, I know that we're running a little bit uh, long with your time, but uh, we so appreciate it. And it's been such a pleasure to actually speak with you. Uh, any plans to write a book about your life? Well, first, let me tell you, if you want to know about what's going on with uh, Detroit, uh, go to DetroitArtsAndCulture.com. If you want to know about me and what I'm going, doing, go to RochelleRiley.com. You can follow me on Twitter if you're strong and can bear it. Um, and I'm working on a novel now that I've been working on for 12 years since I was a fellow at the University of Michigan. So it's coming. Well, we so appreciate your time. Thank you again for being with us and good luck on the book. Uh, I look forward to uh, going on and trying to sit in on one of your Zoom uh, book events because it's like you said, I, you can really be anywhere and do it, right? It's been awesome. I was in Colorado Springs last week in the federal <laughs> of Thank you. But you need to maybe go to Florida right now, right? <laughs> I want to be a person. So. Exactly. Yeah, the negative six in our cars today. Yeah, nah. <laughs> One day. But again, thank you so much for your time.